Okay, so my first question is, uh, which will be the evolution of the use of social media in the business field? And this is a question made by Gabriele Antoniazzi. Well, I mean, you're already seeing the the evolution, the ad, the, uh, the the adoption of social media in uh, in business. I mean, you you see the kind of like the first step of uh, getting a presence on on social media channels, right? Which is kind of like the the main focus of what's what's been going on right now. You have to get your Facebook wall. You have to have your Facebook account, your Twitter accounts. Now companies are going crazy trying to get on Pinterest for whatever strange reason, uh, just because it's the flavor of the moment. Um, so there's this there's this rush not to be left behind now, and that's that's kind of the, uh, the the stage that we're in for most companies. And once they're there, it's a matter of acquiring fans, acquiring followers, and likes and subscribers because that's reach. And marketing folks understand reach. The, the, the whole concept of media buying is how many impressions can I get for my money? How many people can I reach for my money this one time or over and over again? So we're still kind of in these early stages of, of looking at social as kind of a marketing medium uh, that just has a lot more conversations and you know engagement, all those buzzwords that we hear uh, going on. But I think that moving forward – Areas that are going to change or evolve a little bit for businesses um, are are going to be in first of all analytics, uh, and I'm not talking about measurement and monitoring. I'm talking about actually analyzing data. And one of the great um, opportunities with social is that when you look at, at at a platform like Facebook or Pinterest or Twitter, people are constantly giving personal information away. Right, they're giving clues as to what they like, what they don't like, where they go, who their friends are, uh, how much money they might make, where they live, where they're moving to. So this is all great for market. Um, and if you look at Facebook from the back end, right, if you could pull back the curtain and look at it backwards, what we see is a cool place to share things. On on Facebook side, it's a funnel for information. Right, you tell them everything. You tell them what brands you like. You tell them what brand of sausage or milk you 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 consume. Um, so for marketers and for companies, that's really important. If you're a car company, you can get a lot of information on a particular type of consumer at a particular time who might be you know in the market for a car and who might be swayed on your car or or. Um, having a preference for your car and having an intent to buy, an intent to purchase. So, so I think that the the first thing, the first evolution that we'll see in this kind of you know very pro marketing focus that we've had so far is understanding opportunities and using the data that we can get out of out of social platforms to enable sales and to acquire customers, not just fans. Uh, and I think that the second evolution is is really something that we've been talking about since the very beginning of this social media you know evolution uh, which is the humanization of, bland, of brands right we're talking about humanizing corporations which is sometimes very difficult and most of what we've seen so far has actually right it's 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 the the con this, but it's not actually being done by most companies. The um, the folks who handle the social media accounts, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or anything else, are still kind of behind the veil. You're you're not really interacting with them directly. You see that you know it's an account, and there's like little initials at the end. Uh, you can find out by going to a page who manages the account. But it might be a different person from day one to day three. It might be a different person in two weeks, uh, and you might never know who they are. And so it's kind of difficult to, to humanize a brand, to put a human and, and to, to engineer a human around the, the interactions that you have when you're still just talking to a logo and some unseen person in an office somewhere. And some companies have, have realized that very early on. You look at Ford, especially in the United States, and immediately um, they, they kind of doubled down. They had... They had on the one hand the Ford accounts for the different products and, and categories of conversations that you might have. But you also had Scott Monty, who was very much a human being with a face. It was Scott Monty, not Scott Monty at Ford. Um, and, and that worked really well. And ironically, in the beginning, you could see the difference between Scott Monty getting a huge amount of followers and getting a lot of interactions. And the Ford accounts on Twitter not really getting the same kind of success. And and that right there is the best illustration of of the power of actually do, 
doing them. It's just that most companies are afraid to for, for a lot of practical reasons. One, you have to find the perfect person. Two, the, the, do they really have the authority to speak for the company, right? Are they really a spokesperson as opposed to just a blogger who's, you know, filling the, the Facebook pipeline with content? Um, are they going to screw up? And, and what happens if they leave in six months or we have to fire them or, or whatever? Um, will will that, that human connection that people have with this person actually take away from the conversation they should have had with the brand? Um, so these are, these are questions that need to be answered. Uh, but, um, but anyway, those, those I think are two of the main areas uh, where social are going to go because the there we go. But the uh, the rest of it, you're going to see a continuation, essentially the same thing um, that that you've seen now. A lot of content, a lot of uh, a lot of interaction, a lot of pull with Facebook videos and and articles and blog posts and and uh, the same kind of churn to try something out, get a reaction, and get some uh, get get some feedback. I was actually asking you. Um about the uh, information on Facebook. You know, when you see it from the Facebook side, it's a lot of information that just pours in about uh, millions of people and their yeah. habits and what they like to use and, and buy and, uh, and uh, you know, what they enjoy doing, with whom, it, and, and so on. So what I was wondering is what, where do you think the, the fine line, you know, stands? Because there has been so much talking about the privacy and uh, the, uh, you know, the importance that data has and the fact that most Facebook users or Google users don't actually know what ha what happens when they surf right. the internet. So where do you think, you know, the you have to you have to put that line? Well, you know, it's it's funny the uh the, the caption don't be evil, which is Google's line is is actually right on the money. That's really where you need to be. It's just you you can't just say it. You have to also uh, you know, act accordingly. So, uh, uh, there are two pieces for the, to this. The, the first, making sure that uh, people actually know what, that they understand what they're giving uh, when they're doing a search or when they're on, on a social platform or on the web anywhere, and, and how that information is going to be used. And I know that there are laws of disclosure, right? If, I mean, if you really look at the service and all these agreements and the things where you click that little I agree uh, box just before saying, you know, whatever, go there or, or sign me up. Nobody reads that. And it's, it's very unclear. It's, uh, it's, it's legalese, right? It's just nobody's going to read five of legal language. Um, so it meets the legal requirement, but it doesn't necessarily does the job of educating or at least really notifying people of what's going on. And I think that companies need to be a little bit more clear about um, what they're doing with the data, how the data might be used, and, and actually put it in a language that is understood or easy to understand. So that's that's the first thing. That's that's just a, a corporate or, or you know professional responsibility as a service as a company to do this. Um, the second thing is allowing people to really truly opt in, not just say, "I understand," and you know, shut up, sign me up, right? I'm just clicking this because I have to. Uh, but also letting people. Will truly say yes. That's okay. I understand why you're going to use my data, or that that really the data that you're collecting from me is going to help advertisers target me with ads that are relevant to me, as opposed to getting stupid ads all day long by by companies I don't care about. So if the idea is, um, and and I've, I've used this term before. I was just in Amsterdam, and, uh, and and I talked to a crowd of people about this, and and they weren't necessarily convinced that I was right. But I think there's a difference between Big Brother and Big Mother. And Big Brother, of course, is the you know the 1984, the George Orwell, you know, the state owns everything and controls you. It's a, a theme that comes back a lot when we talk about data and privacy. That you know, who's really looking at this? Is it the government? Is it corporations? Do they know too much about me? Are they controlling too much about what's going on, etc.? So there's this specter of Big Brother that's insidious and that, that's going to kind of, um, you know, do bad things behind your back because they know too much about you. But then there's Big Mother, which, in my opinion, is essentially the same the same mechanism, but the data is used for you. 
So, of course, a platform like Facebook would benefit because they can sell that data to advertisers and that's how they make a lot of their money. But at the same time, they protect the consumer and they, they protect your, your, your time in a way and your by uh, matching you with the ideal brands at the right time. So, for example, right now I'm looking at the at the ads that I get on Facebook on my wall, and they're ridiculous. They they make no sense, and I don't understand with all the data that I give Facebook why the ads are so bad. It's you know it, it's for like online webinars that teach me some kind of criminology thing to you know because whatever it claims that it's it's a path to being recruited by the CIA or something or the FBI, mm -hmm. which one, I don't want to be recruited by the CIA or the FBI. It's not something of interest to me. And two, it's complete bogus. And so I see a lot of these ads like, you know, train your chihuahuas, how to, you know, not pee in the house, whatever. Um, but by using the data properly, I could be targeted on Facebook when it's known that on the for example, on Tuesday, I really like to eat pizza for lunch because I talk about it a lot. Hey, it's Pizza Tuesday, whatever. Um, I would want to get an ad or a coupon or some kind of prompt from a pizza company saying, hey, try ours at the right time, you know, in the right context. That's of value to me. Um, you know, Chihuahua training and, and CIA courses, no value whatsoever. So if you can, if you can use that data – um, to really enrich or improve people's lives, to, to target them with things that seem serendipitous. Like, wow, how do they know about that? That's weird. Um, it's a little creepy, but there's value behind it, and I don't mind that. Um, I, I want to be targeted by that stuff, not by the other stuff. Um, and then the third part is, is letting consumers control the extent to which um, their privacy isn't necessarily um, being scrutinized. But, but how it's being pushed back or how the data is being pushed back. So, for example, the, the thing I also talked about in Amsterdam is with most of these apps, um, because most of them will have some kind of advertising or marketing messaging mechanism or channel going through them to, to put your way. I, I want a volume button, you know, like something you have on an iPod, right? You know, turn it up, turn it down. Or, or a little circle, just something that I can really easily control and, and turn the, uh, the privacy and, and interaction settings up or down depending on, on where I am. So if I'm walking around and it's Saturday and I'm shopping, uh, I might want to turn that, that interaction volume way up so that it's, it gives permission essentially to advertisers or to the platform to prompt me with messages or with advertising or, or with you know uh, community managers saying hey we notice you're in our area why don't you try come in for a free coffee um, but if I'm not shopping and I don't want to be bothered I want to be able to turn it down or even turn it off I don't want any advertising right now just leave me alone and uh, and I think that would alleviate a lot of fears and a lot of discomfort with people's notion that their their privacy is going to be you know invaded constantly by marketing messages, not just data collection. So you get those three things, and and uh, so the clarity, the, uh, the 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 true kind of you know value behind it, where the consumer really sees that that it's not he's not being exploited, uh, and the ability to control it. Uh, on on your end, on the consumer's end, and I think you won't really have anything anymore. Um, okay, so I'm going to go uh, forward with uh, another question for from our um, readers. Um, one of these is from Matteo Castellani Tarabini, and um, he asks, how at, at what amount, for what amount does a well-structured social media strategy actually have uh, an effect for a company today? <laughs> wow, that's that's a really good question. I don't know. Uh, it really depends. The uh, you know the the strategy or what you're doing. Um, you know, it could work. It could not work. You could have a hundred really good people working on it, and it might completely flop because it missed a point and nobody cares. Um, or you could have a really small business, like a like a butcher shop. And they're on Twitter and Facebook, and they're and, and they're doing stuff. And by virtue of the fact that they're really, you know, they've they've connected with their audience and their community, it's it's gangbusters for them. And they might not even have a very high volume. It might be a, a level of engagement that touches ten or fifteen people, but it's very good. Uh, and 
you know, objectives, whether it's, it's, you know, getting them to come back more in the store or, or buy more, you know, cuts of veal, uh, or it's, you know, talking to their friends about it and recommending, hey, you should leave your neighborhood and come to this neighborhood and, uh, and get your butcher, uh, your, your butcher needs filled. Um, I don't know. It, it really depends on that. So there's, unfortunately, there's no way to predict what's going to work. It's, um, it's kind of like trying to predict or at what point does a video become viral? You know, it's, uh, I don't know it. If I knew that, um, I'd be very rich and, uh, and, and I'd be giving you this interview on, on CNBC. (laughs) Um, so yeah, no, you, you just have to kind of, you know, start with what you want, what you want to accomplish, not just be there and engage and, and, you know, have a conversations, but, uh, but really figure out what you want to do, what your little goals are or your big goals are and, uh, and, and see what works and what doesn't. Um, for me, uh, a successful social media campaign or program or or you know endeavor um, is uh, is is always one that that really gets a lot of fun involved. You know whether they like you or they hate you, if if they talk to you and they share information and you you get a lot of comments and a lot of interaction, obviously people care enough that that. You, that um, they're going to spend time, you know, listening to what you have to say, listening to what each other have to say, and uh, and and talking back. So when you see high levels of interaction, that's usually the mark of of something successful. Um, so that's that's a good place to start, I think. Okay, since uh, there is one topic that um, for months now, if not years. Uh, has been, you know, uh, one of the main topics of conversations when it comes to the use of social media, which is the social media ROI. And you've you've written a book about it, so uh, I my, I'm going I'm going to ask you one question about the book because um, you described it in your um, biography um, as a book as a blueprint for companies looking to build social media programs that will actually yield results, not just fans and followers. Right. So how do, you, how do you actually reconcile this part with what you just said, you know, about engaging people? You know, we're talking about the success of, of a social media program. Um, like, at what point does it become successful? And, and I think you start to see where it becomes successful when you start seeing, you know, activity, when you start seeing engagement. That's the point where, where you kind of, uh, in French, would say, passer le cap, which is to, to go around that corner and you start to see things happen. Um, but you need that. So the elements that you, that you need in, in terms of, of, you know, getting a successful or, you know, success for your social media program is, um, you know, significant reach. Uh, and it doesn't have to be huge. If you're a small business, it can be very small. Uh, um, engagement, uh, a passion, or some kind of you know momentum behind that engagement, and then and then being able to drive that to uh, to to meet the goals or the objectives that you've set for yourself. And for most companies, there is a profit motive somewhere down the line, right? The the reason why you want more fans and followers is because you want more customers. And the reason you want more customers is because you want them to spend more money with you. So you want more revenue, you want more profitability, uh, and social media fits in like a lot of other uh, business processes, whether they're communications-based or not, right? So you can use social media to acquire new customers who are going to bring more money and buy more stuff. You can use social media to get customers you already have to either buy more stuff uh, every time they, they transact with you or buy from you more often. Um, so, so these all lead to you know, generating more revenue. At the same time, social media also tends to be or can be a lot more cost effective in terms of reach and impact than, uh, than traditional media. And so there's profitability if profitability there. You can, through social media, even if you don't increase your sales, even if they stay flat, you can reach the same amount of people than a lot of traditional media, like TV advertising, for example, which can get pretty expensive. So there's a profit motive there as well. And so wherever you have those two things, generating more revenue or you know, through any of those means that we just talked about, or saving more money by doing things in a more cost-efficient way, then you have the potential for ROI. 
And that's, that's always um, one of the main justifications for a company to invest in a social media program. And, you know, it, it should be said, and I know it's, it's kind of common sense, but it's easy to forget it. Social media is not free. Uh, the platforms are free, but but you need qualified people to go out to your communities to to strategize to create content. Um, you the the analytical tools can be pretty expensive. Uh, the monitoring stuff can be pretty expensive. So all that adds up really quickly. You know, you hire three four people, you get the software. Um, you're looking at you know two hundred thousand dollars minimum for for you know a, a burgeoning program for. A normal size or a large size company, um, that's a hell of an investment. If if you're a small store, you're not going to be able to do that. If you're a major company, you can, but you know somewhere down the line, there's going to say, "Why should I pay for this?" Right? What's right. what's the benefit to me? Um, to the company, I understand it's great for the brand, but this is my budget. Right. And I have goals to meet, and how does this serve me in my department? Right. And and that's where the, the the rubber meets the road, and that's where the ROI thing you know comes in um, uh, at, at a more kind of pragmatic level than just you know my my social media program is successful because I have engagement. 